Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everybody? It's Jeff Mosher and Adam Kaplan. You know what else is back? The NFL Draft is back. It is tonight. And Adam, I don't think I've been more excited for a podcast than I am for this one. Uh, it's it's sort of like uh, when you got something exciting to do in the day or, or like, you know, I'll, I'll relate it to like if you're going to get engaged that day and you got the ring in your pocket and it feels like the ring's burning a hole in your pocket. You just got to get it out. And we have so much yeah. intel. Yeah. We have a lot of really good information. And the, the, the gift and the curse of this thing is that I think you and I would both acknowledge you get the best information literally within, I'd say, 24, 48, even 72 hours before the draft because the teams have had their meetings. Everything's finalized, right? I mean, it's you're not just getting the person you're talking to, but they can tell you how their whole team, they can tell you about arguments in the building, discussions that people <laughs> had on certain prospects that gives you just a wealth of knowledge. But then when we do this, the short life is, the, the shelf life of this podcast is very I short. Know. So I know. Um, kudos to all of our listeners who are listening to this before tonight's eight o'clock start because um, we got a lot of really good stuff. And I think we're going to leave everybody with a really good idea on what this draft is all about, what these prospects are all about. Of course, what the Eagles are, are, are looking at in the direction they might be going, but also some other NFL teams as well. So yep. uh, uh, Adam, you're out in Las Vegas. So you're there. Um, that, that's gotta be, what is it like? I mean, Las Vegas is already, one of the most amazing places on the earth without the draft there. And now you put one of the greatest spectacles of sports there. Has it just been extra crazy or what? It's so funny. So I, you know, I flew up uh, Wednesday mm -hmm. and the great Pete Chiraki from Chickies and Pete's was on there. Uh, he was on your flight. Yeah. Pete. Yeah. Pete and his son who was the intern for the Eagles last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, yeah, it's uh, Pete jr. And then, uh, our, our buddy Danny Spadaro from the Eagles website was there. I was on the, uh, John Ganod was on there from PR. Nice. Uh, Brian Napoli from, um, uh, from sales, a great guy from marketing, marketing sales. And, but the funniest thing is, you know, there, there were some Eagles fans on the flight, but, um, uh, you know, um, I go, I'm staying, uh, you know, on the strip, um, work for a company called sports grid while I'm down here. That's why I'm here. Um, and, I, I don't, you know, it's not like I'm counting. Easily saw 50 Eagles fans just walking the strip. I spent, I, I'm pretty good at packing and not forgetting stuff. Mm -hmm. I just cannot believe it. I, I had, you know, I had a list, a pack list. So I don't, so I just cross it off. I forgot my, uh, my charger for my phone, which I have a high speed charger. Oh man. You don't even want to know how slow this thing is. I just paid 30 bucks for like, uh, this one's from like 1987, this thing. It's oh, terrible. Yeah, but hey, it, it, it only took four hours to charge <laughs> It's real first world people problems right there. I man. know. You get the wrong but, charger. <laughs> but it sucks though when you're, you know, when you're trying to call people and then you, you, it gets down to, to, to 8%. And you're like, man, I don't know how long this is going to last. But right. uh, no, it, you know, it's warm. You know, I heard back home on Wednesday it was pretty cold, huh? Uh, yeah, it's very windy. It was very breezy yeah. today, about 58, 57. It was, okay. you know, hopefully it, it gets a little bit low 80s here. You know, it's going to be close to, it was actually low to eight, mid 80s and, uh later today it's going to be probably around 90 right. and yeah so they're going to hold it i think pseudo outside i think some part of it's outside and nice um on the strip of course it's really cool you know yeah it's just so bizarre that there's an nfl to the raiders here that, that's the thing i just can't get over that they play here <laughs> i know right i still have trouble i still out. probably say oakland um way more yeah. than i say las vegas right yeah. they're not oh they that's right they played here last year correct did they play uh, well, there was a COVID year, right? so they played in front of nobody. I think uh, two years ago, and then, no, the, but wait, didn't the Eagles play at the Raiders? Oh, oh, the, I'm sorry, I thought you meant two years ago. Yeah, yeah, this past season, the Eagles went out there, and, and uh, that wasn't one of their 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 oh, yeah. Raider uh, material games, right there. Yeah, they got blown out, but yeah, I would have, um, man, I would have loved to have come out for an Eagles game out here. That would have been cool because just the just the you know it's cool. I mean, you got you know, I checked out the sports book. Uh, sports books here just to see what's going on. Right. Got the, right. got the playoffs. I was able to watch the Phillies game, which is cool. Yeah. Um, you know, Wednesday. Uh, and yeah, it, you're right. It's a, it's a cool atmosphere. It's just very odd that it's out here. Right. It's even more odd that they have an NFL I, team, but yeah, I mean, to me, it's a match made in heaven. I mean, just, you know, yeah. the, the event city and the main event of the NFL off season, that, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Um, so, so look, we, we've compiled a lot of information so much so that, uh, as I, I'm listen, we had a ton of fun. Our last podcast was our annual mock draft podcast. I thought you and Andrew DeCecco 
did great jobs. Uh, I enjoyed doing it. Uh, it was fun. I thought it was really good because we went through a lot of different prospects and why teams would pick them. We went through scheme. We went philosophy. Of course, if we had to do it all over again, learning what we've learned, probably yeah. make about seven or eight changes. Of course, at it's least. A mock draft. Yeah, but that's it's, why it's called a mock yeah. draft, right? Yeah. Of course, we don't, you know, do trades with it or anything like yeah. that. But um, it's uh, what I wound up doing was taking the draft. Um, thanks to our intern Justin Morgenstein, who helped put it up in um, like story form, aggregated form, and then I added a comment for that one of us had you, me, or Andrew for each each oh, pick, cool. right? So it's up on our website, insidethebird.com. You can read it there, see what we said about each one. But just just keep listening to this pod, and you'll you'll get even more information right there. Um, the final intel with Greg Cosell. I shouldn't say final because we're going to do one more with Greg that recaps. Oh, yes. Pre-draft. Every, yeah. yeah, recaps the draft. But the last one before the draft was, I thought, maybe one of the most fascinating oh. ones. We, we really hit a lot of linebackers. We hit a lot of safeties. Um, so not only just day one guys, cause we, we do that a lot, but also some guys that might interest in the Eagles and day two and day three. And boy, did, uh, uh, I'm going to pat myself on the back. Cause I asked Greg the money question at the end oh. and got a nice little whopper of an answer from him, which if you go to our Twitter accounts at inside birds for, for inside birds, it's been tweeted. Uh, Gre- I asked Greg basically who his, you know, who, who's going to be the guy, you know, three years from now from this draft that everybody's like, wow, that guy was, you know, that was the pick right there. And I was not expecting the answer that he gave us. I, I think you were a little surprised too. I was, in fact, you, know, you put, he hates being put on the spot. He hate he hates, he hates rankings lists. I was actually wants- ready, waiting for him to rip me and, you know, yeah, exactly. uh, you know I- but he actually answered it. So I'll take he the bullet. <laughs> he he, he went hard and, you know, he was annoyed by it. But then in the end, I love the way he went at it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny because when when we started having Greg involved with us a couple of years ago, I warned you. I said, "Listen, this is the way he is. Yep, very anal about it. He doesn't care about anything else other than tape review." Yes, he's like um, Chip Kelly. He no, does not like hypotheticals. No, he, he has no idea where players go, and he could care less. Right. Um, and I, I, I get it. He just he's 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 like a lot of our listeners. We all want to learn, right? We all want to yeah. learn. He, he doesn't. He as smart as he is, and he's clearly. Um, of anyone who does draft information, he's the best guy. He's the most accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, but he doesn't so he doesn't care about mock drafts. They, they don't mean anything to him because nobody has any idea who's going to be drafting the players. Right. Um, he, he just wants he all he wants to know is what do these guys look like pre-draft? And then he'll 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 adjust his thinking once he starts watching their pro tape. And it's actually really cool. Um, and we'll we'll probably do a post-draft series. Uh, well, obviously, as you said, our post-draft show will be him with the review, all the Eagles picks with him and how they fit in. We'll have our own information. And we're going to do a live stream, right, uh, tonight, I think, after the first yes. round? Yes. So for, for those listening, and we'll have more information put out on social media, too, we are going to do a post-draft live stream show with you and me. Uh, it'll probably start around 11 o'clock because we're going to wait until the entire first round's over. Um, so just so that, you know, we can actually give it time. I mean, you got your, your responsibilities there with sports grid and I just want, and so do you just to be able to talk about this thing, not in a rushed manner. So, uh, uh, right around, well, you know, we'll let people know through social media or just as soon as the draft's over, just assume that, uh, head on over to inside the birds, YouTube channel, and we'll be starting our FaceTime. I mean, our FaceTime, our, our live stream <laughs> show, uh, as soon as we possibly can. And we will get, um, all the Intel and information that we can. And the cool thing is, well, theoretically, if it's two picks, we'll have a lot to talk about, you know, or if there's movement, oh, yeah. trades up, down, whatever, we'll have some, some good stuff to talk about. And then we'll try to cap it off with a kind of a look ahead towards Saturday and what they might be, or Friday, what they might be doing uh, in I'm, that pick. I, a friend of mine, a season, a season ticket holder, called me. Uh, he said, hey, what do you think they're going to do? I'm like, well, you know, well, you know, there's, here's, there's a packet of uh, six to eight players that we think they're looking at. But because when he goes, is there any surprises coming? I'm like, I don't know, but if there's just a major surprise, it's good for business. <laughs> yeah. I like how nice someone up. asks you if there are any surprises coming. Like, well, if you knew that, it wouldn't be a surprise. Exactly. No, no. The way he said anything that might happen that no one's, t- you know, like no one's talking about. I'm like, well, like the Eagles taking a punter in the first round. <laughs> oh, but let me tell you something. That Matt, Matt Ariza kid from San Diego State. Yeah. Um, one of the best punters in college football history. And by the way, he is one of only three players to have a, Pun of 50 yards and a field goal of 50 yards in the same game. Wow. That's incredible. Unbelievable. And I watched this special. 
I'm showing ESPN. I was mesmerized what this guy was doing. He's and he's a lefty. He's a lefty. Oh boy. I can see the press conference now. Eagles took him in the second round and yeah. talked about the financial value of having one guy playing two what? different positions of punter I know, and that's, right. That's, right. <laughs> that's right. No, Jake Elliott's pretty good, but yeah. um, I would say this with this kid, this Ariza kid, he could go as high as the fourth round. He, he is incredible. And uh, he's worked with Nick Novak, the former uh, Chargers kicker. Um, mm. th- this kid is special and uh, it's, we'll see. He's, the only punter is supposed to get drafted if he gets drafted, but I'd, I'd be shocked if he's not because he's so dominant and unbelievable. And by the way, he also likes to tackle. Like he's he's not the biggest guy in the world, but he's he gets after it. So anyway, that's right. Matt Arizo of San Diego State. Well, that's good stuff. Good stuff. And I like the the even the question of any surprises because to be honest with you, I feel like and and I think we've both gotten this kind of information when you talk to people who normally have an idea of what their team's going to be looking at at a certain slot, you can start to t- discuss that. But this year, probably more so than any I can remember, I feel like people are asking me, like, well, what do you think? Who, what, what do you know about what this team's going to take yeah. and what that team's going to take? There is so much uncertainty starting right at the top, right? Because there's not the obvious quarterback going to the obvious team, and that's going to push, you know, really good pros- non-quarterback prospect A, B, and C down a 6, 7, and 8, right? That happens every year. This year, nobody knows. So uh, so let, let's get into that because this is a very interesting draft from what I'm told because it – and I heard you talking with Mike Gill on Football on 4 on 97.3 the other day, and you said it perfectly. You said that it's not considered at all a very good draft in terms of having elite blue chip, multi-all-pro, Pro Bowl-type talent. Uh, I've gotten that same thing. And I've also got a different variance from different teams on how many first rounders, you know, guys with first round grades. One team told me 20 to 22. One team told me 14 to 15. So, and by the way, the team that said 20 to 22 also acknowledged that they're first round grades, but they don't think any of those guys are actually all that elite, even at the top of their 20 to 22. So you got the same information. Uh, Do you get the feeling that, three years down the road that this is going to feel like that 2013 draft where literally Lane Johnson was like the only guy who was any good from it. (laughs) It, it, It's you mentioned the blue name, the the, um, blue chip or blue prospects. Yeah. It's a scouting term that um, the Giddings family, they uh, they're the ones who are their, their consult, their, their scouting service that the NFL has used for decades Mm -hmm. and uh, they have blue, purple, green, red, and anyway, high there's blue and high blue. There are no high the, the only high blue players. So we'll just get right into it. Sauce Gardner mm-hmm. um, would be would be a blue player. Uh, a GM told me he's the best player for this draft. I would say he's elite. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, the kid, the, the corner Stingley, um, as good as Gardner's been, he's not put up tape like Stingley did in '19. But the problem is Stingley's tape has been so disappointing. I was just say disappointing. So inconsistent the past two seasons. Plus. He's missed so much time. Right. It, you know, this is the story. This first, this first round, I, you, you and I were talking before we taped this. The more personnel people you talk to, the more questions they have. There are very few clean prospects. When I say clean, uh, without an injury history, without an off-the-field history, or with or a football character issue, is he, this guy lazy? Does he work hard? Um, is he entitled? You know, whatever the case may be, there's a lot of that in this first round with some of these players and yeah. these some of these are pretty good kids who unfortunately went to a school where um, they don't push them. So certain programs or a couple of kids have what they call are high rep guys where they need more reps than other players do. Right. It's a scouting term, which right. we haven't used very much, but I, boy, have I been getting it uh, this week. Yeah. Um, yeah, stuff definitely. I was, yeah. I wasn't aware of some of the stuff. So it's interesting that with all the calls you and I made, because the, the, the last thing before we move on, you're absolutely right. When you talk about this first round, now look, Two, three years from now, 10 of these players, which we have critical stuff about, they might become pro bowlers. That's mm-hmm. not the point. The point is pre-draft. This is the way teams see them. This yeah. is the information that they've given us. We'll see. Good luck to these kids and the agents and the clubs. But the fact of the matter is, you know, teams are going to find this stuff out. And, and it's funny. They all have access to trainers and coaches and at, at colleges, right? 
mm-hmm. but it's the teams who have great security directors. The Eagles have Dom DeSandro Strific. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Cowboys for years have a guy that uh, actually it's one of maybe the athletic or one of the uh, co- um, media companies wrote about the guy. The, these sc- these uh, security directors are so important for this for the NFL draft. No, no doubt about it. Um, yeah, you can argue that they're as important as the, as the guy making the picks or any uh, any scout because the information that they're providing at, at for many people in this draft, as you just mentioned, I, I, you know, we'll get into some names, but there are some guys who I thought were pretty talented guys. Like for example, Co- Greg Cosell does not dabble in that stuff at all. There are some guys he does. Some guys he hears about. Some guys he knows nothing about their background. And he he told us, you know, he likes this player. Then you run it through, you know, NFL scouting circles, and they're like, yeah, but he he's you know got some real character flaws, and he's got this, and he's got that. We don't even have him on our board. So that's the that's how important those mm. security guys are because they can literally take a guy who's a really good player and just completely remove him from the board. And there are several teams I've spoken to that had sure. guys who you're seeing in mock drafts right now going really high removed from other teams boards so that that's really fascinating stuff and I think that adds another kind of curveball for fans who are reading all these mock drafts and getting accustomed to seeing a lot of names going certain spots and then when that doesn't happen they they think maybe like the team reached or the team did something wrong by ignoring a guy but they didn't know about some of the red flags and at one point Adam I I asked one guy uh, a scouting source from the NFC as we were going through guys and sort of these these chat these red flags are, are piling up i said is, is there any clean prospect i know there aren't a lot of them and he said oh yeah yeah there's two now <laughs> something like sauces that. sauce gardener sauce what, I, what i say yeah. when we say clean on and off the field and injury history right uh, there's there's nothing there stingley's a great kid i, I right. love the background um his dad derek senior and uh his late grandfather uh, Daryl Stingley, you know, for, for those of us uh, might remember, his, uh, played for the Patriots, unfortunately, with the, the terrible injury, mm. which ended his career on the field. But um, good kid. It's, he's, he's got a lot going for him. I just hope that um, he could stay healthy because he could be special if he could stay on the field. But see, that's the thing about this, man, is Bill Pullian has said many times, he told us last year on, on, this, on our show, general managers are generally risk averse, particularly in the first round. You can't move. You can't like. You got to pick somebody. Mm-hmm. Like, no, there's no. Look, we, you and I were young once. We were knuckleheads. You know, we we were. And then you want, <laughs> but as we also know, as talking to people this week, yeah. But you need. To, you're going to give these guys millions of dollars. You got to make sure that they can handle it. Yes. But so the maturity thing's pretty big. That's probably more more than ever. Mm-hmm. Didn't hear much about drug problems or anything like that. It's just maturity. No. We're hearing. Yeah. A lot yeah, of not, the, not a lot of legal stuff either. No. It's, yeah, no, it's, it's, um, yeah, maturity and the word, I swear, I heard this word more this year when describing some, some players and what they didn't like than ever before. The word selfish, mm. I heard a lot, like a selfish kind of player, meaning like they felt that the player was more, the prospect, I should say, was more concerned about his image, his brand um or if he's on the field is his stats you know like if he if he's a defensive end getting sacks as opposed to either creating pressure or just the idea of winning or or holding a team under x amount of points so the word selfish came up quite a bit and um Mm -hmm. you know we'll we'll get into also on some of those guys too i i really you know it's not that i'm uncomfortable Uh, if you if five people tell you they did a meeting and all five di- people say the same thing, then I feel more comfortable. I don't like it when one guy says, you know, nitpicks and says, oh, yeah, I, I got a bad vibe. I'm not gonna, we're not going to get into that. But when yeah. it's pretty obvious and apparent, we'll, we'll get into that. So, uh, and the last thing I want to say, Adam, just on the draft overall, I don't want to scare people off with the Eagles picking at 15 and 18 and say, well, it's a bad draft, so they're not going to get good players. Um, yeah. While it is short on elite talent, there are p- people like the overall um, – uh, the, the surplus of, of good players. There's good players in this draft who are going to be able to come in and help. And you can get good players in the second round, third round, maybe even early four. So that they're, they're, it's deep in certain areas with good players. So I don't want to frighten anybody. It's uh, it's not like you're going to, you know, if you're picking six guys, all six are, I've got, you know, really, really difficult odds of getting on the football field or being good players. It was that fair to say from what you're, you've, you've heard to. Yeah, it, it, it's a deep draft at certain positions. The receiver, it's 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 really deep, uh, but unfortunately, not a lot of elite players. In fact, you could argue that mm-hmm. there aren't any. 
because Jamison Williams towards ACL. If not, now we'll, we'll get into his scouting report. We have additional information, which is really interesting, which I had not heard. Even Greg didn't have the uh, the stuff that we got on Williams in terms of uh, what mm-hmm. the tape looks like. Just something different, little 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 things. When we, I love talking to receiver coaches because I get they're the mo- they're brutally honest, man. They it's it's good. So we, you and I were able to talk to some coaches this week. So. Um, but yeah, overall, it, it's it's a pretty good group of receivers overall. But I, I don't worry too much about elite. You know what? Um, if the guy could play for you 68 years and be very productive, you'll take that any day of the week. You know, Anquan Bolton, by the way, second round pick, did run very well. Tough right. as nails, leader, terrific football player. He wasn't elite. You would have right. taken him for Robert Woods. I'd take him any day without the ACL, but I'll take him for eight to 10 years. Sure, sure. No, no doubt about it. I totally agree with you on that. All right. Um, let's get into uh, some Eagles related stuff. First, I want to remind everybody that we have welcomed a new partner. They are Devacor. Over the last year, we've all seen what's known as been the great resignation. It's very clear that there's no better time to change careers than right now. Devacor is a Philly area family owned career development company that helps guide hardworking professionals on the path to new and fulfilling careers. Unlike those big companies in the career development space that offer the same cookie cutter advice and services, Devacor's certified career development team is hands-on, passionate, knowledgeable. They take pride in working closely with their clients to ensure that their experience is personalized and tailored to their needs. So whether you're in need of a new resume, a cover letter, CV, or you want to optimize your LinkedIn profile or just work with a career coach, Devacor has got you covered in all spaces. So go to devacor.com slash birds to schedule a free 15 minute career coaching consultation and to receive an exclusive 15% discount on your next order. That's devacor.com slash birds. Now, Adam, I feel like some of the um, prospects during their interviews uh, this off season or this pre-draft cycle probably could have used Devacor and maybe some of them came off in the interview would have been a little bit better to them. Exactly. Based on what we heard. (laughs) Look, interviewing is, is sort of a lost art, how to interview and what to say, what not to say. Yeah. Because you want to project well in whatever job interview you have, you want to be positive. Uh, And that, that, that to me is just so cool. This is so key in today's world, wherever you have to interview and, the prep work that Devacore could give you. Plus, I love the LinkedIn optimization. That's that's something that everyone could use if you're in the business world. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Got to keep up with the Joneses on the internet. All right. So let's let's talk about the Eagles. Um, they did a lot of interviews <laughs> for the last two months. Talked to a lot of prospects. With the Eagles, Adam, I think that when you – I love the way you've said the answers to the test um, comment because the Eagles have done a lot of homework on wide receivers, both in free agency, right, and, and the draft cycle here uh, on defensive linemen where pass rushers, what they always look closely at, especially in the first round. Uh, corner is no doubt about it their biggest need. I mean, we've talked about that ad nausea. And they've done work on corners. Um, and of course, they're always a team to watch when it comes to offensive linemen. I, I have been talking about interior offensive linemen with them, and I still believe that that's an area they're going to address. Uh, I know you have a little bit of intel on that more so than I had, because I, when people have asked me, you know, who are the, you know, we've done a ton of interviews lately. And I say, look, the three positions that I, I feel strongly that the Eagles are going to try to address if they can in the first round of them, it's going to be of D-line cornerback and wide receiver and I would say I felt like interior line might be something second or third round but there are some really good interior offensive line prospects and the way the draft goes I I guess you'd have to consider that pretty you know up there with the other three as well yeah so uh you know when we talk about targets yeah absolutely At, at 15 or 18 depending on see the problem with this draft is you just don't because there are no there aren't there are very few elite players. Mm-hmm. The, the the problem that the GMs are trying to figure out and personnel directors and and so forth, how they're trying to figure out what the other teams around they're going to do before them and and potentially if they want to trade up. You, you know what the team's needs are, but you don't know what their grades are because this is it's pretty easy if you've got if you've got a great top 12 players you there you know you don't may not know exactly who's going to draft them but you know they're going one through 12 you could you could line them up like that mm-hmm. here you can't 
because they're just there's so few elite players. In fact, depending on whatever term you want to use, there are not a lot of great players for this draft. The lead is better than great. Elite is best of the best. These are these going to be all pros, not just pro ballers. Right. Um, there are a lot of very good players, but uh, like Aiden Hutchinson, right? Aiden Hutchinson's mm-hmm. a very good football player. Is he elite? I don't know that. Depends yeah. on who you speak to. He, right. could, he may very well could go. He's certainly going to go one, two, or three. Right. Um, but not every player. Look, is Kyler Murray who went number one an elite player? No, he, he was drafted number one for a system. Right. But not every player who's going to be drafted in the top five, anyone sees a leader even close to it. It's just you got to take somebody and you grade them and you take them off your board. You, you, you mark them off on your board. Sure. So, so let's talk about some of the offensive players that the Eagles might be looking at, um, at both 15 or 18. They're, they're so close. I mean, it could be one or the other. Yeah. When we did our mock draft, remember I I was there at 15 picking for the Eagles and I'm like, Ooh, you know, Jermaine Johnson's on the board, but so is Garrett Wilson. And I sort of vacillated. I said, you know, they normally go pass rusher. So how about Johnson? We went, we settled on Wilson and then Johnson was still available in our scenario at 18, which kind of goes to show you, what it's like when you're picking that close to um, when you have two picks that are that close. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk wide receiver. Uh, Jamison Williams, the intel I've gotten is that if he didn't have the ACL, he'd be the best. Wa- he might be the only one of all the wide receivers who you would say has the potential to be uh, or projects to be an elite wide receiver in the NFL. If he didn't have the ACL deal. Yep. Check this out. So we were able to talk to some receiver coaches this week. Mm-hmm. Um, two of two of the guys that I spoke with point out the same thing. I had not heard this before. Now, one guy said, "Now, now he, I know that's out there. Some people said he's like like Tyree Kill, but this coach said that no one's Tyree Kill." He said, "Let me make this clear: nobody is Tyree Kill. No one could do what he can do as a receiver. You in and out, stop, start, change, go direction. across the middle, right? Vertically, explosive, obviously. Uh, laterally, his lateral movement, unbelievable." Mm-hmm. But Jameson Williams, pre-ACL, and obviously it was this before he tore his ACL this season, and then he was at Ohio State before that, um, the most explosive receiver on tape, one of the coaches said, since Tyree Kill. Uh, now, here's the problem that, the, that both guys said. Route running, he's got a ways to go. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. he's come back from major knee injury. Um, very raw as a route runner, which I would not heard that before. Um, these two coaches, these guys know what the hell they're doing. So I was like, all right, that's good, good information. I'll... Uh, you know, which which tells me once he's recovered, whoever drafts him has, has got a job on their hands. They've obviously he'll be rehabbing this entire offseason. Um, so he's not gonna be able to practice. And then, you know, you got to make sure when he comes back that he's got every, he's not only speed back, but he's explosion and that he feels right. And then you got to work on his route running. Right. Um, there's certain things that he just could needs to brush up on. He's not like totally raw, but he's not advanced like some of these, the other guys that are that uh, you know going to go in the first round. So I'll give you a name that I think of when you say that. A guy who has a second level gear that's unique and different than everybody else in the draft. Um, doesn't run maybe the entire route tree so well. Uh, I, I it sounds like you're, you're talking about a Deshaun Jackson like player, but but a little bit bigger physically. Well, actually, Deshaun is – well, Deshaun was always a good route runner. He's just so uh, – Deep route right. runner. He was not necessarily the best – earlier in his career, intermediary route runner. He, I, I can tell you from people who coach him, they always said he was a good route runner. Hmm. That's but interesting. Okay. his problem was when you'd body him up because he was so wiry, that was a problem for him because there's certain coverage. This is – remember there were some years with Deshaun and the Eagles receivers that just could, they had trouble getting open? Yeah. Because you pressed him because Deshaun is – Slight, right? But yeah, he 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 was a pretty solid route runner. But James Williams is very raw in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, what I okay? Let me let me just clean this up. He's raw. No, he's raw compared to these other guys. He was just finish right. this up, right? Um, he, he just maybe it's certain routes that they've not asked him to run. Mm-hmm. He just needs a little bit more work than I anticipated. I've not heard this before, so that was and two guys mentioned. I'm like, all right, I got to mention this. Right. So, um, but look. He's eventually going to be a really good football player. Yes. He's just going to, he's going to get over. He's going to be coached up. Now we'll see where he goes. Mm-hmm. Now, the other part of it is how hard he's willing to work. We just, you know, well, that's that. We, I don't know much about his background, but the challenge for him is um, to come back from this type of injury. Remember, he's been through, look, he transferred, you know, we don't to, to Alabama. The tape was incredible. Mm-hmm. His, his uh, 
ability to eat up space is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, now I, I, I do know some of the coaches I spoke with did say they asked them, why did you transfer? Um, and they, what they would do is the coaches would call the Ohio state coaches mm-hmm. or program, whoever they would speak there. Hey, why do you think he left? Cause we, we know what he told us, you know, they, so they, I know they both checked, uh, two of the guys I spoke probably to four or five receivers coaches in the last couple of months, but these two guys I spoke this week said, uh, they both had called there just to get his, to verify his version. It seemed to be you know pretty close to what he said. Right. Right. So, well, you have to think. If he's available at 15, the Eagles are going to have to really think, yeah, not have to think too hard. I mean, uh, I don't know who else will, will be, but that is a guy that the Eagles would definitely would want to bring in. Now, he's not, per se, the bigger wide receiver that they've sort of looked like the Allen Robinson type that they've looked at. They worked out trail on Burks. You know, we know Aaron Moore had led that meeting, and and um, we'll get into that a little bit more in a second, but they, they are looking for a natural X. But I feel like this is a case where you're just taking the best – player available as long as your medical people project that he's going to get back to being the Jamison Williams of the pre ACL injury. Right. And that's the thing, you know, he, he barely played, um, you know, at Ohio state, he only had 15 catches over two years, but then to, to blow it up to average 20 yards a catch mm-hmm. and he had 79 or seven. It's just crazy. I get it's college football, mm-hmm. but he just would run, you know, the, these coaches would say, you just shake your head. You just, you, you haven't seen, they're like, you know, it's one thing on TV, it looks a certain way when we're at home. Mm-hmm. But when you watch, when you watch coaching tape and you, I, I get there's a lot of space in college football, but when you see this guy just run by people on a nine route and they, sometimes they actually, they might touch him and he still moves by them. It's pretty incredible. It's too damn bad. He got hurt, you know? It's, it's, yeah. He would have been yeah. a top five pick, by the way. That's uh, people I trust told me that. That's well, that's great. why, again, if he's there at 15, then it's yeah. it almost feels yeah. like you're just going best player available. And, and as long as your medical people think that he's going to get back to that level, uh, clearly they felt that about Landon Dickerson, right? And they took him in the second yeah, round, despite right. multiple knee injuries oh, and yeah. for at least one year. So far, it's it's paid off for them. Well, uh, let's let, one thing let, go ahead. Just one thing I would add this good well, what you just said about um, taking Landon Dickerson. This is why medical information is so important. Mm-hmm. Had, our understanding of Williams is he had a clean, uh, a clean ACL tear, you know, isolated ligament tear. So you know it's you know six to nine month rehab. You know we know he's doing well with it, but that's being ahead of schedule is only ahead of schedule for now. That doesn't mean he's going to be ahead of schedule in August. Right. So, but it's not you know whatever you get out of him. As one GM told me, it's great in year one. You know, the, this GM said he will he'll be able to play this season, but they don't know when. Right. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it's about the future. And, and on this particular show that we're doing here, if the Eagles draft him, just think about an, him and Devontae Smith together for many years to come. If this happens again, the, you know, nobody knows if that's going to happen. Right. They may go before them mm-hmm. because again, this is not a great draft overall for Kellen and he's got special ability. Look, his route running is way better than Christian Watson's just for comparison sakes. Who's got, we'll get to him later. Mm-hmm. He's got major challenges, and in, 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 uh, Watson does in, in route running. This kid is just doesn't run a lot of routes. Needs to finish them off. Needs to be cleaner and crisper at them. Mm-hmm. This is just a matter of coaching at this level, and a one-two by him. There you go. All right. So another guy who plays the same position that honestly, up until the last, I'd say two or three days, I, I really had not been making a lot of this guy to the Eagles connections, but now I, I, my radar is much more up on it is Drake London from USC. And now I part, I'll, I think Greg Cosell partly influenced me at first because about three or four weeks ago, we did wide receivers with him and he, he liked, it's not that he doesn't like Drake London. He just questions because he's six, three and he's, to what 20 he's he's a very big he's probably the biggest most physical receiver in this draft and the tape says that he doesn't necessarily he doesn't beat guys on speed he beat guys he beats guys with contested catch with catch radius with body shielding shielding and i know for every eagle fan it's like ooh, that sounds like jj ortega <laughs> white's right we, we, yep. we made that joke but this but even greg noted that this guy is clearly more fluid of an athlete yeah. And made a Marquez Colston type of um, of uh, of comparison, but um, as as it was pointed out to me, Adam, the fact that he's a big target. If you look at what the Eagles have, 
They have a lot of smaller targets. Devontae Smith, small guy. Quiz Watkins isn't the biggest guy in the world. Jalen Rager, and who knows what goes on with him, but still, he's not a, a very big guy. They have The Eagles have fast, twitchy wide receivers that don't have, outside of J.J. Ortega Whiteside, who's now a tight end, right? They don't really have that yeah. big, physical X receiver that you and I have talked for a while about how would really benefit them. So it does make sense when you have Jalen Hurts as your quarterback, as it was pointed out to me by someone who's, who's no, right, who's smarter than me, that this is kind of an ideal complement to what they already have with the quick twitchy guys at wide receiver. This is a guy that Jalen Hurts can just kind of throw it up to and he can bring it down at, at a variety of levels on the field. Um, so I, I find that he didn't visit the Eagles. So that that's interesting. But I, from what I've been told, uh, character is good. Leadership good. He's one of those few guys who didn't seem to have, uh, you know, one of those flags about, you know, is he, is he just in it for himself? Yeah. So, so that, and I, I'm going to give you this quote from a guy I got from, um, from an AFC team, because I, I really drilled this guy. He likes Drake London. I said, well, what about this? What about that? You know, can he really win on the outside? And he said to me, this kid is going to be special. Nobody, meaning no corner is going to beat him because he'll get every ball. He may not mm. separate, but he will win. He didn't separate in college, which is a good acknowledgement there. It's no bias, right? He, sure. But he didn't lose any battles. He's the best contested catcher I've ever seen in person and one of the most fluid big men. Wow. And his comparison was Mike Thomas from New Orleans. And Michael Thomas is a slot receiver. And by the way, Marcus Colston started on the outside. The mm -hmm. Saints for many years, then they moved him inside, and that that extended his career. He actually became a really good slot receiver. Right. Michael Thomas is essentially a big slot. They'll they'll move him a little bit, but he'll he'll wind up inside most more more, more often than not. And he's obviously a great player. Mm -hmm. uh, to this day, I'll never understand. Like I I understand that he doesn't run all that well. That's why he didn't go in the first round. But his per, his productivity is ridiculous. Right. right. What does a guy have to do to go in the first round? He's got to run well. Okay. <laughs> Now, I asked a second guy uh, from a team that's done a really good job at wide receiver. This is an NFC team. Um, and he, I, I specifically said, can Drake London play the X and win in the NFL? And he said, yes, he can. So that's two pretty good endorsements mm. right there for Drake London. Um, care to add to that? What, what, what kind of intel you've got on him? No, that's uh, – I was just told, you know – reason why I put him he's he should be in discussion with Philly uh you know again is it um but we don't have access to the draft board it's just it's just a name that came up with people I trust um uh, contest a catch look that I get the separation's an issue for analytics I guess that could be a, an issue but does he win or not he wins that's that's as your source your your source from the AFC said um, if the guy wins, he wins. That's important, mm -hmm. man. It, look, if you're dominating f with physicality and you continue to win, that's what matters. Right. Now, and, and and he he here's his measurables, right? He's just under six foot four, uh, in seven ace, two twenty, um, average arm length at thirty three, hands nine and three eighths, you're decent wingspan, decent seventy seven three quarters. Um, he's coming back from the broken ankle. But you know what he's, you know what he is. He's not going to shock anyone. If he ran the mid four fives, it doesn't matter. You know what exactly who he is as a football player. Like all of a sudden, you know, you watch the guy and say, "What if he ran the mid four fours? Are you all going to sudden you know, drafting top five? No. You, you, <laughs> this is the stuff. The funny stuff about the forty. Right. It's just like sometimes teams just overrate it. It's what does the tape tell you? Right. As Greg would say. Right. What does the tape show you? Shows you this. He's a contested catch guy. He's the best in college football. Adam. There you go. All right. All right. So those are the, those are two wide receivers who we feel could be in that range for the Eagles. Um, I mean, there's certainly some others. You know, obviously there's a, a Chris Olave. There's um, I don't know if Garrett. I know in our mock draft we had Garrett uh, Wilson making it to the Eagles at 15, but that was one of those things that I second guessed immediately yeah. after. It just it it just it's a mock draft. So you, you you certain things happen. You go, man, he really needs to go in the top 10. Right. In fact, uh, what I had heard, Houston's all over him. Uh, you know, so I'm not saying he's going to three, but that, uh, his floor 
uh, we were told would be 14, and that's I don't see it. I just don't see that happen. Now, I did this. One of the receivers' coaches told me, as much as he likes him because he's so polished, he's so good. Uh huh. In a let's say you had you know, like four or five, uh, six, two, six, three, six, four guys who all could run. Garrett Williams would go somewhere between 15 and 25. It's just not that type of draft. He's, right. and this is not a criticism of him. He's really good. Yeah. He's really good. He's, and by the way, what we've heard is he's really good at everything. He's just not elite. body control. Right. The, the body control of him is elite. Okay. But that's not really like a stat right. or something you could like. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good, nice trade, but it's not going to move you either way. Right. This kid is so good. And because the great thing about him is, as you set the show up today, in a draft, there, there's so many questions. There are no questions about him. Hard Correct. to find. Correct. So that's Garrett the only Wilson, guy. If he, yeah, Garrett Wilson. If he falls to 15, of course, you're going to correlate. Oh, to, you're you're going to correlate seconds. him to pretty much any team at that point if he falls yeah. that far. So, because it, it becomes like the CD Lamb thing where, oh, my God, he's still here that's for the it. Cowboys. Right. So you just take him because he's that good. Yeah. That's what happens. So so what it, um, this happens, not in every draft. Occasionally it happens in drafts where three or four guys drop. You're like, what? The hell? Why are these guys dropping? You know, what happened? Mm-hmm. Well, like from an outsider standpoint, like you and I, who are not working for a team, we don't know when it happens because we weren't expecting it. There's some information we were privy to, and we'll text someone and they'll tell us. But, oh, wow, that's interesting. It never got out. You know, um, mm-hmm. that happened. Like the JHI stuff, you know, that because he was projected to be a second or third round pick. He had a bone on bone condition. And this is why medical information is, in, is very important. They, the, it was, what, I don't know how many years he played, but he was only supposed to play four or five years. Right. Your short career, you, you you know you got to go buy your medical people. Yeah, and by the way, one one important note I want to make that I thought was really um, important that I got from uh, an AFC guy on Chris Olave, yeah, who some have said uh, you know isn't as uh, what, what's the word I guess isn't as diverse with his route running as Garrett Wilson. Like he only ran a few routes at Ohio State, so you have to question the route tree uh, abilities there, and he's not the biggest guy either, so you know, can he only run run routes and not really win in anything but certain routes? But as this person pointed out, when you have two really good receivers on one team, Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave, right? And one guy's already the lining up in one area and running a specific number of routes, that limits what the other guy is able to do. So he felt that if you look at uh, Olave's tape over the long haul at Ohio State, you'll see that he can run all the routes pretty well. It's just that this past year, with them having Garrett Wilson there being like kind of the number one guy and he was one A or two, whatever you want to call it, his route tree was a little bit more limited. So I thought that was a pretty interesting note for, for some who have said Olave doesn't do enough uh, to, to warrant being a top 15 or top 20 guy. He, he he's Here's what he's got. He's explosive. Mm-hmm. Uh, the knock on him, I would add, is that he's not as physical as you would like uh, based on the people we spoke with. And they were a little bit harsh on their – criticism on that part they'd like to be more physical yeah you know okay but he's explosive he's a good football player he's going in the first round right uh what do you think do you think he would be in the like again we don't know what the eagles board looks like but we always sort of hear okay here's a cluster of players that eagles have been on you think he'd be in, the, in, in you know if they were going to go receiver 15 or 18 you think he would be in their their uh the market for him? well my sense is if you you know if they if they were Hell bent on getting a wide receiver, um, they would want probably three or four guys ahead of a lot, like Jamison yeah. w- w- Williams, Garrett Wilson, Drake London. I think would be more preferential to them than Chris Olave. Uh, now, and then you'd have to consider who else is available at other positions there. I I wonder if if. Um... If Wilson dropped, I don't, again, I don't expect him to get out of the top 10. He shouldn't. Mm-hmm. But if certain crazy things that teams start trading out for other players who drop, who knows? But I do wonder there. So they're at 15. If somehow he got to 11 or 12, they, they would have to trade up for him. That's just because that's why they traded up last year for mm-hmm. Devontae Smith, because he was at that tier that, let's say it's their second tier. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, he's the last guy that tier. Let's go get him. And that's they, what they trade up tw- uh, two spots last year. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, let me, that's uh, let why me amend would... that. They might have because of what we spoke about with the bigger body and run after catchability yeah. that they like. I, I they 
they would probably have trail. I'm, well, I'm, I'm not reporting. I'm just kind of speculating based on things I heard that trail on Burks might fit that need even more so than Chris Olave. So Burks perhaps being a little bit higher in the pecking order for that, that reason. He's he, his, his thing, man, uh, might as well get to it since you mentioned him mm-hmm. uh, is he's a specialty type receiver. You have to scheme him. Yes. I'm open. Uh, yeah. It's, Beauty's an eye of the beholder. He's not going to be for everybody. That's the way he's explained to me. And you right. better have a plan how to use him. That's why people talk about Debo Samuel. Yep. But my information is similar but different. Debo's another guy. Yes, you have to scheme him open. No question. But obviously, Burks is taller and bigger physically. But I don't know. See, is he going to win on the outside on his own? Is he going to run a nine-round win with that? Yet, you know, could he just win by and leverage? Is he? I don't know if he's that player. That's always explained to me at the, for the next level. So maybe London's. I think London would be way higher on their draft board than Burks would be, but I would agree. it's just based on skill set. I would agree. I would agree on that. Um, all right, so outside of the wide receivers, we said on offense, there's really not another position that they would probably focus on uh, in the first round if it's other than offensive line. Yes. Uh, and probably interior offensive line. We've, we've kind of beat that drum pretty loudly uh, over, the, over the last few weeks. Who, who might be someone at that in the 15, 18 range that you think would tantalize the Eagles? Two guys who are going to go somewhere between 15 and 25 ish. Mm-hmm. Kenyon Green from Texas A&M and Zion Johnson from Boston College. Hmm. Interesting. Um, One guy's a mauler, like I know. the A&M kid, right? I know he's a really good football player. Now he could play right tackle. Mm-hmm. Um, now Kenyon, Dream, Kenyon Green visited the Eagles. Doesn't mean they're going to draft him, but it was. I was just told by a very good league source, don't count Philly out for offensive line, uh, you know, early. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think you said it would you said don't I think you said one of our recent shows. I, I did, oh, I said I expect them. I said I'd be shocked if they did not draft an interior offensive lineman, but second. I said day I two or yeah. early day three. Yeah. I, I yeah. did not say first, so yeah, but, but if you've got that intel, that's good. That's interesting. We'll see. I'm not saying I'm not saying you're going to do it, but remember, they have two picks, and you know, what also if their their board gets obliterated, because uh, I, I was listening to the uh, Panthers GM Scott mm-hmm. Federer talk. They have a system called Pick Six. They they always have six players for. I guess it's by computer by the grades that they run a program. Because he was talking about they run this in Seattle. That way, they're never flustered when things happen that they don't expect. So you have to have a cluster of players ready. So if that tier is hit, the next tier could be offensive linemen. So I'm just not going to roll it out. Am I expecting? No, but this is these are things that that we we come across and people remind us. I'm like, all right, that's yeah, a good idea. So. Interesting. We'll put it up okay. Right so you said Kenyon Green from A and M, a real, you know, very visited. Baller, right? Yep. yep. And then who else? Zion Johnson. He's a really good football player from Boston College. Very versatile. Uh, I, yeah. I, I again now now when you're talking second half of the first round, you know, I know some mock drafters have him you know, mid to late twenties. That's fine, but once you get past a certain point, does it really matter? No. It, it's just yeah. It's just get it. He he's just. I, there's no way to project would it be 15 or 18. I know the simple ways. Oh, well, this is only, they would only be drafted if the guys, you know, if, if at 18, if uh, everyone else is off the board, I, I can't even say that. I don't, we don't have access to their board, but we do know some guys that are potential targets for them. Um, some they've had in, some they haven't, but we were told that uh, these are guys that uh, they have some interest in. So um, though I, I would think I, I no, I know that green had an injury. Uh, knee issue in his past like we got some medical information we were, we were looking into mm-hmm. uh, maybe that's why they wanted to get more information on the medical but anyway these are just right. some names to take a look at yeah I wonder if um, they'd be well you never know because if nobody wants to do it nobody wants to do it but if you feel if it feels like that's a, those two guys or maybe somebody at 18 you, you try to trade down to see if you if you especially if you like them oh yeah sure equally. Sure. Um, and you feel like you can get them a little bit later. And interesting that, that Tyler Linderbaum's name did not come up there. So, I oh, mean, I... all right. Information on him. Okay. Yeah. So, I just want to update something because that was interesting. So, I talked to some offensive line coaches. It is generally true. Of these, you know, these guys said it is generally true. Most centers could play guard, except if they're big enough physically. I should have mentioned that when we talk about this in our mock draft. Yep. You know, one of the guys said, Leonard Paul's not playing guard at the next level. No chance. He said he's too small. Wow. Um, he's not strong enough. He said he's super, really good at center. 
but he's just not built to play guard. He said, it's just not going to happen at our level. I'm like, okay. Wow. Wow. You. Well, if the Eagles felt that way, you can understand why he wouldn't be first round for them, because if Jason Kelsey is going to play this year, you don't want to draft Tyler Lindenbaum and then say, there are some positions you're willing to wait a year for. I don't know if you're willing to draft a center in the first round and then have to wait a year just to play a center when you already have a couple of guys on your roster who could potentially play, play center. So that's pretty. And right. And they, they like, as you know, versatility on their offensive line, especially on the interior, right? The, you know, the Dillard thing is throwing them for loot because, you know, he, um, oh, oh, I will tell you mm-hmm. that uh, what we had heard, you know, this week is he might, he might not, he's not moving to guard if they keep him. But finally, he's, there's, there's, there's a belief that he's going to start taking some reps at guard. Hmm, some cross training. Um, okay. Yeah. If they keep him, that's something I'd heard. That sounds really, um, inconsistent with what kind of prospect he was a, a dancing know. bear with great feet who was not a very good mauler or a or good against the bull rush when you play guard you really only see bull rush i mean it's not like you see wonderful athletes who are trying to use all this space and i mean you're you're it's it's a bull rush that a defensive sure. tackle does so, I, I, so. yeah what i would add is i mean again if he's been by the way he's put on a, a lot of weight and muscle like he mm-hmm. less uh i guess there's some pictures out there or something social media but he i'm not saying like you know and in practice again they may trade him who the hell knows but you know if he's getting 30 reps in practice maybe only gets five at guard and the rest are at left tackle who, who knows right i'm right, saying it's right. possible they work him in at guard a little bit in doing their ota program and um this is a big year for him no matter where he is whether he's with the eagles or another team because uh they got the fifth year option due which obviously mm. they're not going to pick up see now th- see if they were progressive enough <laughs> this is me ripping the eagles they would have thought the opposite way. Have him lose weight and see if you can make a tight end out of him with those feet. Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> Don't put him inside. <laughs> did he ever did, did, when they were on jumbo? Did he was he an extra tackle? I don't no, know. No, because he could never play on the right side. Oh yeah, that's that's why I asked because I didn't think they did. Yeah. Jeez. Oh man, yeah. I wonder how much he weighs now because he. The word is he got like a lot bigger. Like he's. You know, I don't know how much he weighs, but yeah. Anyway. All right. So, so those two, um, all right. So we went through a couple of wide receivers, a couple of interior offensive linemen. If the Eagles are going to pick at 15 or 18 and take an offensive player, have a hard time seeing it being any other kind of position than wide receiver or offensive interior offensive lineman. Agree. Not running back, not a quarterback, not a, quarterback. Not a tight end. Oh my a, God. Yeah. So they did quarterback. If you thought my hair was on fire when they drafted Hertz in the second round, I, I, think, I would I literally think fall off my chair. <laughs> I, I would love, honestly, I would love it just because of the the, the content. Oh, sure, yeah. I, I don't think I would be able to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it would be lit. All well, right, the let's fans talk, would go out of their mind. Oh. Let's talk about some of the defensive prospects yeah. that um, we expect to be, you know, really seriously considered by the team. As always, defensive linemen. So. Just like with the Drake London thing, Adam, maybe a week or two ago, I wouldn't have thought Jordan Davis as much because, again, Cosell put a really valuable question in my head. What is the value of a defensive tackle who doesn't rush the passer and only played, what, like 20 snaps a game at Georgia? So that was my mission, to go out and talk to as many people possible around the league on – Jordan Davis and why in the world he would be drafted in the first round when he doesn't do two really important things that a lot of teams look for in a defensive lineman. And lo and behold, <laughs> I'm a, I was shocked. The teams I spoke to don't think that is nearly as much of an issue as the weight. Oh, yeah. They think that's five times more of an issue. So for those who don't know, and, and most people know now, his weight has fluctuated a lot. And there's some that people know, like they know people, he lost 25 pounds right before the combine, which is a red flag, right? In itself. Oh, right. But uh, what's that? You know, you know how much he weighed at the combine. So if he lost 25 pounds for the combine, that's, I think, think it was 340 it. something at the combine, right? 341. So that means he would have been 366. Right. And I, as oh. the information I got was that Georgia had a, they tried like crazy to get him down. And there were times where he was over what he was playing at. So you're talking about a guy who really struggled at Georgia with his weight. And now you can understand why he wasn't on the field playing 
a whole lot of snaps. I mean, it happened in the, I think in the SEC championship game, I believe he had to come out. Um, so obviously people get concerned when all of a sudden, bam, he's got weight discipline right before the combine drops 25 pounds and does that. But th- so that's going to be there. But Adam, I, I, most people I spoke to said the way he impacts a defensive line, you have to look at it like the way Vita Vea does for Tampa Bay. Vita Vea doesn't average 12 sacks uh, a year. And um, another name, uh, Haloti Nada. When the Ravens drafted him, he was a guy who came off the field a lot in pass rushing situations, but he's a pocket pusher. Nobody will run against him, Jordan Davis, and he will make everybody else on the defensive line better just by his presence. And, of course, the big line that you get from so many people is because you just don't find human beings (laughs) that move the way he moves. So, And so I would say, you know, if you know, to people like, like, could you see the Eagles, you know, being interested in a guy like this? And um, a lot of the feedback I got was the defense that they're running right now. Yeah. I mean, look what we've, what would we be, we've been talking about since Nick Sirianni hired John Gannon, that, that the, the way they play their linebackers back and the need for a tackle who can play head up, right. Almost like a three, four nose tackle who can do that. Um, but also play multiple positions on the line. And they, they, um, people, I, multiple people have insisted to me not to worry about the pass rushing thing more than the weight. I would add this. This is another feather in his cap. In turn, you, you, you talk about, you know, people, his size don't move like this. Think about it at 341, right? Now, I know the 40 times completely relevant for, a defensive lineman. It's Joe Banner told us he, he thought it was useless that he didn't even, he never even looked at it. This right. is crazy though. A four seven eight, a th- three hundred forty one pass. He should be running a five three or five five. It's, it's ridiculous. It is unbelievable. Ten yard split was one six eight. Uh, his length is in, is elite in terms of uh, arms arm left thirty four. Wing is long I, over eighty one. You can't teach size, man. This this is this is good now. The weight's a real problem because stamina and someone that young should not be that weight. Now, he's a really good kid. We mm-hmm. uh, checked into the background. He's a really good, really good kid. Wants to get in shape. You know, wants to, you know, and what will happen is, I'll give you an example. Jordan Milata last year in the offseason was 402 pounds. They told him, go lose that weight. He lost 25 pounds. He knew it. And he, for what we're told, he's between two, 375 and 380. Right. When you, when you talk about that for any lineman other than him, you go, oh, that's too fat. Right. Not Jordan Milata. Have you seen him? <laughs> No, no, he carries it well. He can. He it's unbelievable. Can the guy's. In, I mean, he's an absolute rock uh, now. But Jordan Davis, look, you, you, you know, you have to. Make, it's like Trent. Here's one now. Trent Brown went in the seventh round. Trent mm-hmm. Brown was close to 400 pounds when he was drafted by the Niners. He got the picture. He lost a massive amount of weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, some again. I know he's a seventh rounder, but I'm just giving an example of. You got to give guys a chance. Now, are you willing to take that risk on a guy who you're not sure? Now, let, let's extrapolate here. Let's say the Eagles draft him, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's 15 or 18. How many snaps can he handle as a rookie? Because Cox and Hargrave are starting. Mm-hmm. And Milton Williams is your third tackle. So what you do is, this is a, this is a learning year. He'll, you'll dress him every week. May not play a lot. You get him in shape. Mm-hmm. And then the following year, remember, the draft about is about years two through seven. Mm-hmm. You get him in shape. Cox's contract's up. Then you walk away from him. Yep. Uh, Milt Williams will be in the mix. They like uh, Tui Pelotu, as you and I have documented for, mm-hmm. for months now. He had a bad hamstring injury. He's fine. Mm-hmm. But Jor- Jordan Davis is going to take over. He, he's yeah. him and Hargrave, you know, that, yeah. that's the way you look at him. You're too. Yeah. Well, listen, this guy is going to be he, – he's definitely going in the first round. I spoke to a team that's picking closer – you know, I spoke to many teams, but one that I, that I spoke to that's picking closer to the bottom of the first round Oh, okay. said – if he were to be available when they're picking, they're just running to the podium. And yep. so he's special. He re- he is special. I understand that people have reservations. Uh, and it's funny you thought of Trent Brown because I thought, you know, the Eagles have actually gone down this road before with a similar prospect on the offensive line, Sean Andrews. Yes. Out of Arkansas. He wide. I mean, this guy, I mean, almost exactly. exactly. He struggled with weight at Arkansas. He struggled with weight as a rookie. And actually, if his first three years with the Eagles, he was fined a lot. Um, he was very open about his his eating issues um, and that hit and his struggle. But even with all that said, he was one of the best guards in the league. He would have been a oh. tackle sooner 
if he didn't have the the weight issues and then the back issue. Yeah. But he was people were comparing him to Larry Allen. He was he was elite from a talent standpoint. You're absolutely man. Oh, so sad. He he was. That was Andy's guy, man. I remember. Um, I just remember leading up to that draft. We, I had heard he that this was his, this is of the personnel group. Zaney had personnel. Group. He was the one leading the charge on that. One. Uh, out of Arkansas, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Arkansas. He, unbelievably gifted kid. Yeah. And um, and look, they took him 14th bad. overall, sure. knowing what they knew about him with the weight. 14th overall. So um, and he, mm. he they made it work. They were they, it was frustrating and it's tough for a team to have to deal with when a guy's got weight issues and, and does, and he can't get through to him, but if he has the talent and that part is not deniable, then you, you deal with that aggravation and hope that you can get through to him. So, but it is a risk also. I mean, you can't just completely endorse it no, and say, of course, great sure. job. I mean, uh, you gotta, um, you gotta, you have to look at it from both ends and say, Hey, if this didn't work out, you knew what you were getting into. Right. Before we move on here, the one thing I would add to what you just said is really important to understand. He has to be accountable. Like you, you know, when you and the Eagles had him in for a pre-draft visit, uh, we saw him at the we saw him at the uh, you and I saw uh, saw him at the Maxwell Club Awards. He definitely was down in weight. You could tell. Look, we all look good in tuxes, but no, but he looked he looked, he looked like he was down in weight. Uh, but he's so long. I mean, yes, he's broad, but he's you can see the arms are long. He uh, if because that that interview when you get to look at him I eye, eye to eye and say okay. We've done a lot of homework on you. What are you going to do about your weight? Uh, you have to hear what his response is. Yeah, definitely. All right, let's move on to another defensive lineman that um, the Eagles will probably have interest in and, and might be there, might not. Uh, Jermaine Johnson, who's had an incredible pre-draft uh, process. He's really <laughs> opened up a lot of people's eyes, especially at the Sea Bowl. Yeah, it's, yeah real. it's real. I in was fact, there. I'll Probably. just say it right now. I, I got an AFC guy who told me he thinks he's more talented and explosive than Kayvon Thibodeau. So he said, if I had a choice between these two guys for my team, I would take Jermaine Johnson. Um, here, okay, now, now, but he, this was on talent alone, right? Now we, you know, you and I have talked to you know, some people, and we know that there's this is a maturity issue with him. There are. Uh, I know he's a little cocky. Fine, there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. But um, I know he's a little older. But we were told that's not a factor. It's just the maturity issue that teams have to get through. Yes. Um, he's, Nothing wrong with him off the field. Doesn't get in right. trouble. It's just a maturity issue. Yep. Um, and I'm telling you, if he doesn't go by 15, it's that's why he didn't. I'm telling you, because I know he transferred to Florida State. The numbers weren't great there. And some teams are wary for guys who are one year of major production. But just look, you, you mentioned the Senior Bowl. Look at last year's production. And by the way, teams see him either or D end or outside linebacker. They're fine. 34 outside linebacker, 43 hand in the dirt. They're fine. That he could do both. Uh, dominant senior bowl, great combine workout. Um, the club teams would go back and watch that tape again, the Florida State tape, and they could compare it and they see him getting a better chance to play. Also, that's the other thing. Uh-huh. They see the explosion, his explosion um, right out of his stance. He's just a really good prospect. Like, I'll be interested to see where he goes. Uh, top 10 potentially. Uh, there are not a lot of great pass rushers in this draft, but and the Ajabo injury, yeah, that that that's another reason why he can move up. But uh, we got to see these uh, these little. Again, you and I were young once. I would not. I I don't know. Yeah, when I was 20, he's twenty. I think he turns twenty four. But I definitely was not very mature at twenty three. But <laughs> I'm not even sure. Like when when we hear this from clubs, what does it mean? I, I don't. I don't know. I, right. I, no, I have I, to mention. I agree with you on that. Multiple teams said it, and people we trust. And I know you you told me it. Similar information. Yeah. I'm just, I, I'm fascinated to see. I would love him to go to the Jets because they, I feel so bad for them when they lost um, the kid of Tories of Kelly Lawson. Right. That sucked because they, he had, he was unbelievable. He was having a I great felt so camp. bad for them and, yeah. and they need pass rushers. Yep. So we'll see if the Jets dip their toe there. Yeah. He's a, he's very pol- fascinating and polarizing in that way where he could, he could go top five um, and he could be there at 15 for the Eagles. And, and if he is, to me, that's a big. Um, what's what I'm looking for? It's kind of a, a of a challenge to their philosophy a little bit. Not in pass rushers, but they have over the last for quite a while now um, prioritized early in the draft character. Most of the guys you looked at, they've drafted in the first, second, and third round. I would say have all been really high character guys. Yeah. I can't think of anyone that they picked in the first three rounds over the last few years 
somebody's probably going to hit me up with one, but that really had, you know, some question marks around. They picked a few guys in the lower rounds that had some well, character issues. Hightower, but, you John Hightower. We yeah, have the Hightower, right? I mean, I, I think there was something about Jalen Mills um, coming out of college. He had an incident. Um, Got cleaned up, though. Yeah, yeah, then- yeah. But the point is, they they first, second, and third rounds, that's a big priority for them. True. Um, yeah. And, and it's seen. You got they've they've drafted really, you know, good. Yeah, Quez. Guys. You know, yeah. Quez, Quez had to grow up a little bit. You know, right. we, we had outlined that two years ago and it the, the lights started going for him last year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a big year for him. Even, even if they draft someone in the first round, he still has got to have a role because he can run. Right. He's developed. You know, we yeah. I know we had, we had a couple of questions and which are very fair about why don't the Eagles they don't develop enough of the their players now. I think under Peterson's um, watch, there was it was very up and down. But look, my lot has developed. Obviously, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's like one of the best in, in team history. There's a development; it's been incredible. Yeah, um, I'm just know. thinking about some of their second, third, first. Well, we know the first round pick. You know, the Dillards of the world. Um, yeah. uh, uh, who who did they pick last year in the first? Uh, obviously, Devontae Smith, great character, great leadership. Yeah. Uh, J- uh, Miles Sanders had no no knocks against him that we knew of. JJ Ortega Whiteside. So, really solid guy, good person. Yeah. Um, you know, you just you just that, that's a that's a big that they talk about it in the in the post. Even Milton Williams was considered a great character, great leader, a good teammate, and all that too. So this will be a an interesting kind of dilemma potentially for them because a lot of these guys we're talking about have a few of these knocks. I mean, for example, if Kayvon Thibodeau does slide out of the top eight to ten. And they have him, if they have him as an elite prospect and consider moving up one or two or just seeing if he drops to them, that's another guy who is, he's got two things, right? He, he's got this lack of natural bend that you would like it's true. From, an, from an edge rusher. Yep. Greg Cosell was the first to put us onto that. And then another guy who, again, no, nothing illegal, not, nothing that you're worried about, like you're losing sleep at night, but more like, is he a team player? Is he about the team? Or is it a little bit more about himself and his brand uh, kind of maturity issues there that they don't typically, <laughs> that doesn't, it hasn't been somebody, something that's accompanied some of their higher picks over the last few years. Uh, with Thibodeau, he, he's a, he's an intellectual, like he's, I love this interview he did on, um, there's a draft series that they did on uh, a lot of the players. And I love what he talked about. He loves the chess. Well, he's a chess player, but he loves the the strategy of football. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he wants to get in broadcasting. So what? What's wrong with that? How does this? I'm not criticizing you, of course. I'm just no. You know, I know. You, no, you I brought it up, saying, yeah. and it's true. Uh, this stuff is out there. Teams have brought it up to me. Mm-hmm. Who cares? It's right. nothing to do with football, right? Uh, as long as you're you have an interview with him, and you know if you have to bring it up, you bring it up. You mm-hmm. want to know what his interests are and how committed he is? He's absolutely committed to football. There's no question about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the issue, as you brought up. It's stiffness. It's 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 a fact. Greg brought it up. We heard it. You and I have heard it from uh, people we spoke with, including a couple of D line coaches. Mm-hmm. I don't know that could be coached out of them. I actually asked someone I really trust. Right. Said it's really hard. It, right. It's not to do with stretching. It's just a body type and length and how what, you, what your structure is. Mm-hmm. So that could push that part. I think could push him out of the top ten. I'm not saying well. I, I fully expect him to go to the top ten. But mm-hmm. as you said, if he doesn't. I think it'd be more because of the stiffness, the real football stuff than the other very minor stuff. It's like when we bring up the maturity stuff, I don't even know what it means. Right. But again, when we keep hearing it about players from multiple teams, all right, we're going to have to, we're going to have to bring it up. Right. There you go. All right. So we went through Jordan Davis. We went through Jermaine Johnson. Um, you know, Greg Cosell, when we, when he did his show with us a couple of weeks ago, did, was not as fond of Devonte Wyatt as maybe some of the mock draft uh, or draft analysts were. And uh, I would have to say, People I spoke to sort of agree with Greg on on the question, the upside that he's got, uh, his athleticism overall, as far as when you're talking about a top 15 type of guy. I mean, a bo- I, I've heard like kind of late one, early two yeah. is where people felt more comfortable with yeah. Devontae Wyatt. Correct. Yeah, I don't I don't have him on my top 18, my, the 15 or 18 picks I'd have. So, yeah, that would be it for the front uh seven I, yeah do you have i don't have any other names no you know i've asked around about carlot this a little bit just up and down. i mean again also sort of kind of like a later first round guy um yeah. he actually it's weird I, some people think that you know there might be a team that just falls in love with what he brings as a as a 
you know, um, a heady, smart, intelligent lunch player. Pad. Yeah, lunch yeah. Pad. yeah, I don't like getting into that, but exactly. Um, but uh, he, you know, so maybe the surprise when he does go, but it didn't. It didn't feel like we should have a really expansive conversation about him uh, as it pertains to the Eagles at fifteen. Uh, you know, I don't think he's th- th- just to talk about teams that I know not everyone's an Eagles fan watching. So if your team runs a thirty-four front. He's not long. I know he's a – the way he's explained to me is he's a power end, mm-hmm. which is left defensive end. That, that's – you go up against the right tackle. That, that, that guy, you take him later in the first round. And, and also, he's not long enough to play five technique. He's just not. He's just not long. He's, he's six, three and three quarters, but arm length is under 33, good hand size. But I don't, I, I don't get the feeling that he's long enough. No, mm-hmm. He's a tough guy. He's, he's a good football player, but – it's just not a good enough pass rusher for me. All right. All right. So let's move out of D line and go to corner, the other uh, position most likely that we've talked about that they really, it's the position they need to upgrade the most, whether or not they do it in the first round, who knows? But we know that last year, Sertain had him in his sights, didn't get him, wound up getting uh, Devontae Smith. And this year, um, they've done a lot of work on corner. I'm pretty convinced now, as we record this, you know, <laughs> the night before the draft and people listening to it on the, the day of the draft, that it's it's going to be a real stretch to think that they can get sauce Gardner. I know a lot of fans are hoping that Howie makes this big trade, but I'll leave you Adam with, with this from someone who, who knows the Eagles fairly well, um, you know, know, knows Howie knows the guys in the front. They, they just know this guy, know, this person knows the Eagles well. And he said to me, you know, I just don't sense that they want to make that home run type of move this year which is consistent with what Howie himself has said about understanding the build that's ahead and putting their picks to work and not trying to lose picks, but to add to the team, right? To build around Jalen Hurts and build around the team. So to go up and get Sauce Gardner, who I don't know what you've got, but it's uh, for me, it's people don't think he's going to get past four or five at this point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he might, but people really don't expect that to happen. So You'd have to give up. You're obviously you're 15 and and quite a bit to get up there to to get Sauce Gardner. Depends so what I, number. Like, yeah, the, the draft. Yeah, the draft value chart. So someone asked us about, you know, what what are how, how are teams doing it now? That what they do is they look at history of, okay, what did it take a team to get from 15 to eight, or what did it take the team to get 15 to 10? What does history show? You always look at history first. That's where you start. Then every team has their own value board. Their their, their draft the, the 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 old Jimmy Johnson chart. They have they they have their own. They, they use a variety of uh, sources. We were told, and they use analytics attached to it, and that's how they go about it. It's kind of complicated, right? Uh, because it's not it's no longer what the the old okay. There are four hundred points minus R two hundred points. You know, it, it's it is with that, but it's. It's been changed. It, it, it's it's been further developed. It's not the it's not just the old board. It's been updated, and there's certain factors that come into it. Right, right. Do you also get a sense that Howie's not looking to take a home run cut here? I don't know if you've you've gotten any kind of. Vibe I would of that. say that. Yeah, I think it's so much less here. Where okay, they moved up, moved up two spots. There was a no brainer because it came to their um, tier. Mm-hmm. So they did that. You know, they they only had to trade up two to get the, the guy who was still in that tier. Right. Uh, I think similar, absolutely similar. They'll, they'll absolutely trade up if the guy's in range where they don't have to hurt, you know, giving up a future one. Because right. you're you're giving up a future one. If you're getting from um, you know, 15 to three or something like that, now, again, I'm not, they're not doing that. But I'm just saying, you, you're, you know, you're giving up a lot. I, I don't see that. That's not their mindset. Mm-hmm. No, if he gets to nine or 10, why the hell not? Oh, well, yeah, of course. I mean, that that's 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 oh, that that's not really swinging for the fences to me. That's just making a really yeah, good move. You're only going them. up yeah, a, a yeah. couple I'm, spots. Yeah. I'm, yeah. How on the table? I might break the glass. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So so that that would be the only sauce gardener watch I think we'd yeah. have to, is if yeah. the guy slips into that eight to ten range. Sure. And then same thing with Stingley. I would think if he was 10, um, 11, 12, 12 yes. then yeah, he, he I, I I keep hearing. You know, we, we always like to throw in other teams in these things. We, we do draft stuff. I keep hearing Houston is hot, strong on him. We'll see. Um, he's he's so gifted. He's got everything you want. 
I just, it's the injury history. Some teams are going to ding them for, and that's right. That's their prerogative. Sure. But this is not, there's good depth of this class, but it's top heavy. Right. It's these two kids. And then we'll, we'll, the, the other kid that I think the Eagles would have some interest in. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, they had, they had a booth in for a visit. Now he had, he had an injury uh, issue. They, they were able to get an updated medical on him. And uh, you know, the kid, Trent McDuffie, um, you know, I, I've, I've kind of gone back and forth. We were given this name a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to say I dismiss it. I'm like, eh, it doesn't have the arm length. But someone, a very strong league source said, don't forget, they're the ones who drafted short arm Milton Williams. And boy, that looked pretty good for them, didn't it? I'm like, yeah, you're right. All right. Right. He's just really good. And, and you know, you heard what Greg said about him. He said, and he's right. Some teams are going to have an issue with their arm length. And another thing with them is they're not, they're not super arm length. Uh, dependent there are certain measurables they have to have like they every once in a while they fool me where they go oh wow I didn't think they would take a guy with these kind of measurables and maybe it's that super high character kid he's real competitive the tape's really good okay go for it <laughs> right? now most teams I spoke to really like Trent McCup- McDuffie well was one team one guy I can't say any team one guy who doesn't like him as a first rounder likes him as a second rounder but I will yeah. definitely tell you that that was a minority opinion as opposed to other people who I spoke to, because he checks off so many, but literally the only box he didn't check off for most of the other people was the arms, right? He's got right. the speed. Right. He's got decent size. I think he's what? Six, one or six feet, right? Right. At six feet, six, Mc, one. He might be five eleven. McDuffie is act. No, he's actually short. He's five ten and three quarters. It's it's he's okay, that's, that's actually not terrible. That's about yeah, an okay. average size. It's yeah. very, you want, see, it's interesting. You and I have talked about this with these tall corners because uh, Bill Pauline pointed out with Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman cannot play in pure man because he can't turn his hips. Mm-hmm. He needs to he needs to play where he can hand off in zone. Right. He was just great at it. I mean, you give him a good area. He's smart, tough, long, former mm-hmm. receiver at Stanford. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, he the kid McDuffie is super competitive. But I mean, he has some of the shortest arms like I've ever heard of. Yeah, him I mean, and McCreary they're, they're like. Yeah. yeah, him and McCreary, who are both McCreary's a little taller uh, from uh, Auburn. Some of the shortest arms for guys who are going to go in the top four, like you'll hear. But there's if their tape's good, you have yeah. to understand though. McDuffie would be more of what we call a number two corner. I know sure. teams don't like to call him that, but if you get them off the record, they'll say that. Yeah, he's more of a number two. Yeah, uh, but yeah. he's a good football player. He is one of the I was told cleanest prospects in the draft. There you go. That's as important. far as character, yep. tape injury everything you know like literally the short arms and the unideal size for corner is about the only issue that you're going to have and i had one person tell me that they thought with in two or three years they felt he could be a pro bowler because he's the wow. character is so good the the wow. willingness to get out there and learn to be great at your craft he's okay. got so you know uh, what with that you say that i'm taking i'm absolutely taking the first after you just said that it you know i know you've got you talk to a lot of personal people Jeez, oh, I'm, I'm, after that comment, I'm I'm taking him the first round for sure. If, if someone you talked to said this guy could be a pro bowler early mm-hmm. in his career, he's that good. Mm-hmm. And Greg, look, he passed the Cosell sniff test. Yeah, Greg liked him. Yeah, yeah. So Greg, yeah, I know he's super competitive. Okay, mm-hmm. that that would make some sense. There you go. Now another guy at the same position would be Kyer Elam, uh, Kyer Elam from yep. Florida of the famed Elam family of defensive backs. Uh, He's got better size. Now he's six he's long. He's six one, six two. I think he's long. Yeah, good player. Uh, the sense I got was, uh, and and I wish I had a little bit more time because I, I was trying to get an idea of why he wouldn't be up there with, say, you know, McDuff or maybe he is for some or or mm-hmm. or Stingley. And I don't have a great answer on that yet. Maybe you do. Um, but everyone I've kind of spoke to has talked about him in the in that second tier of corners, like a late one, early two guy. I've got him. Yeah, this would be more for eighteen. I, I would have him the second part of the round. He's just long and a good football player. Yeah, he, he has this weird thing where he's tall, but his arms are short. I, I'm I'm gonna double check this. Another another short arm guy, huh? I know people laugh at that. They make fun of me when I say this. But look, we just this, we, the reason why we mention it is because this is important NFL teams. Yeah. We wouldn't waste our time. Yeah. Yeah, his arms are short for a guy of six, one and a half. Wow. Oh, yeah. Abe's his dad, a longtime safety. And I, I guess Matt Elam would be his 
that his brother or cousin who played was uh, a first rounder for the Ravens who definitely related. Fizzled. Yeah. Yeah. Fizzled. But anyway, um, yeah. Oh, I, just, I, meant to, I meant to give you this quote real quick on McDuffie okay. before we move on from him. Yeah. Uh, this is from an NFC scouting source. He's okay. a great kid. He's everything you want as far as a locker room guy and a great team and teammate. And his film is just really good. Athletically, he's not an elite athlete, but he's a good athlete. So here, here's what they have to do. The reason why I mentioned Elam is I was just talking to someone in scouting and said that he would match um, Gannon's system you know, mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. on a skill set. But here's the thing, though. McDuffie's more of a number two corner, right? Okay, well, let's just say, we'll, 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 before we move on to their next subject here, let's just mm-hmm. say they draft him, right, at 15 or 18. He comes in, starts, and then you know, Slay's you got a couple good years left. In him. He's still a really good player. He hasn't really regressed at all, but he's 31. Yeah. He's 32 in January. So these guys just lose their legs at 32 or 33. So – they're still gonna, they still need another outside corner. They're not, they cannot be done there after your round one. That I would, I know they could do it next year, but mm-hmm. Zach McPherson barely played. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I would think that they would still hit that, you know, mid to late round in the draft. Um, and it also, it, you know, it would drafting one of these guys that would at least buy them another year for to maybe in the following year to draft another corner. I mean, look. They went 20 years without drafting a cornerback in the first round. I'm, I'm acting as if they're going to do it now. I don't, we, it could be 21 by yeah. the end of tonight. So there's no, no law. If you can take two wide receivers in the first round in a row and maybe three, you can certainly take a cornerback in the first round sure. two years in a row, especially this team well, and how the they've way, reflected it. It's a, pro, it's a top four position when you build a roster and roster building. Right. Cornerback. So, right. um, and it's funny, I, and I was going to say, well, yes, and, and then the Eagles uh, could continue their streak. Will the Eagles continue their streak this year and not draft a linebacker in the first round? There will be 44 straight years. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. All right, so listen, let's, let's put a uh, – before we move on, because I want to just get to a few other prospects, 15-18, I mean, we've mentioned some pretty good names here. We're, we're talking about, you know, if it's offensively, Drake London we mentioned. Um who was the other wide receiver that we – Jamison we, Williams, London. Yeah, yeah Jamison Williams, Drake London. Uh, defensively uh, – oh, and, of course, the, the two offensive guards, uh, uh, T- Kenyon Green and uh, Zion, Zion Johnson, who's yeah. very ver- – by the way, Zion, some people think can play center, so keep that in mind too. Ooh, he's yes, very athletic. good job. Forgot, yeah. forgot. Yeah. Uh, and on the other side of the ball, we talked about Jordan Davis, Jermaine Johnson, and, of course, the Trent McDuffie and, and – uh, Kair Aleem there and and you know we did mention other names where you might have to trade up or maybe go yeah, back but that that just feels sure. like really good names to discuss when it comes to the Eagles right now we'll get to a few more in a minute first I want to tell everybody make sure you're checking out our friends at phlsportsnation.com enhancing the fans experience with their coverage of all Philadelphia sports teams for the fan by the fan is their motto so make sure you're checking them out at phlsportsnation.com and on Twitter at PHL Sports Nation. Let's pause real quick for a word from our other great sponsors, including our friends at Sky Motor Cars. And if you happen to head out there to Sky Motor Cars in Westchester, PA, make sure you tell them Adam and Jeff sent you. You'll get a great deal. Uh, Adam, let's let's wrap up on some other prospects because you just never know. Draft's full of surprises, and there are a lot of guys we have some intel on. So we'll start offensively. You've done a lot of work on Matt Corral. What have you found out? He is, uh, just from an arm talent standpoint, he's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, there, and uh, Albert Breer had a piece on uh, MMQB about there's some challenges with, with, with kind of maturity and some other stuff. You can go read it. Mm-hmm. I've heard similar stuff about him. Mm-hmm. That's why he had a lot of visits because teams, in a draft like this where it's a pretty wicked quarterback, he's so talented. Mm-hmm. Teams want to get in front of him. That's why I believe he had a lot of visits. Uh, we'll see where he goes. I, I'm not convinced. If you you can't remove the, the the character knocks on him, I mean teams have some questions about him, but he's so gifted. I, I'm just really fascinated to see if he goes in the first round or not. Because if you didn't have any questions about him, you could say he's a top twenty pick. That's how mm-hmm. gifted the kid is, mm-hmm. you know. But mm-hmm. so that's something to just keep an eye on. We'll we'll have more about you know we'll, we'll obviously talk about this about post draft, right? Um, well, that translates well to uh, another player that we're going to discuss, um, okay. the wide receiver from Georgia. George Pickens, yeah. because um, the the talent is undeniable 
and unquestionable. But you talked about the, the various stages of red flags. There's medical and there's character. Well, he's two for two on those. And the character ones are pretty intense as far as my discussions. And it sounds like yours too, right? Yeah, medical is okay. But it's, well, I mean, just the fact that he had the ACL injury. Yeah, it's fine though. That The, yeah. the issue is... Um, the issue is maturity, uh, mm-hmm. say the least. Yeah, it's we we yeah we we've heard some, yeah we've heard some stuff. I think didn't Greg, didn't Greg say something about it last yeah, show? Yeah, I was surprised. That's the first yeah, I had heard like of it. it. It made me ask yeah. around. Greg, Greg actually used the word head case. <laughs> uh, I, and, and I don't after know. Checking into it, it, it yeah. didn't. Yeah, that's a yeah. that's a tough word because that, yeah, I because that, that can mean a lot. Yeah, that can, when but but here here's the deal. There's no question. There's some some challenges with maturity with him. Yeah, like he he. I would say, it's 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 always fascinating because when you talk to coaches, like oh he's he thinks he's the man. Like he he thinks he's the, he's arrived already. Stuff like right. that. Right. Um, which which means he's got some entitlement. Mm-hmm. But here the the key is, and they also have psychological teams have psychological testing. It's extremely important what the tests tell you. How is he going to handle money? How is he going to handle this? Is he going to work hard? Does it mean something to him? Is he going to work hard? Mm -hmm. Um, Does he understand the commitment that you have to make? You can't just show up because you're very talented. That'll be found in, uh, as you explained to me, this will all be found in psychological testing. Yeah. And then that'll ultimately decide. uh, Eagles, all NFL teams have, you know, people who do this for them. They hire, they they hire outside, not counsel, outside people. Um, to to you know their the specialized testing look it to me if i'm the eagles if he if he if you know you interview you know because they had him in for an interview mm-hmm. and him and sauce Gardner actually interviewed on the same day if the interview went well and he's there 15 draft him because he's super gifted he's going to be look he played at georgia i, I know he transferred in but mm. this kid is a, is a is a stud i mean you'd you have, have to, to feel comfortable yeah you would have to feel real comfortable yeah. um Listen, here, here's a quote from one, one person I spoke to who was a pretty high-ranking executive. Mm-hmm. He said, quote, he's not off of our board, but he's hanging on. He said he'd be shocked if a team took him in round one. So, it's, again, maturity issues have, have certain levels, but yeah, it yeah, sounds exactly. like his are fairly obvious. I think so. one person described it as as soon as he, he walks into the interview room and the conversation starts, you get pretty good idea that, that the kids got some, some, you know, that it's not just confidence. It's a little bit of a, of a cockiness okay. and borderline mature, you know, you know, what are you all about type of issue there? Right. You know? Oh, I don't actually. Okay. So he did play. I, I, maybe he didn't transfer because he, he had three years, you know, he played three years. Uh, he was a retro junior. He, he, and he, uh, he left. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously he had the ACL injury in November of 2020, but uh He's just so unbelievably explosive, and his his workout was good. Uh, combine workout was good. He's all the way back physically, mm-hmm. but man, the maturity thing just keeps coming up. You know, keeps coming yeah. up. It um, came up enough, so you know, you know. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's uh, let's finish off some offensive prospects. Uh, do you have some anything on Tyler Smith, the offensive tackle, who who Greg Cosell described as almost having no idea what he's doing in pass protection? You know, he's a kid. His, his thing is that from Tulsa. He yes, he may play guard, he may play tackle. He's super athletic. He's super raw. You know, he's new. He's new to the offensive line. Right. He's the kind of guy. Let's say you draft him in the third round. You kind of do what the Eagles did with Mylotta. You just now his thing. Obviously, he had a back surgery, uh, back issue, whatever. He had an epidural. I think maybe his first or second year. Mm-hmm. He went through back issues, but. This is more medical, but this kid is so raw. You can't put him in your practice club, but what you do is you have him inactive every week and you just let him practice. Mm-hmm. By year two, you like to have him active and see if, because the Eagles are so aggressive with these offensive linemen drafting them. Mm-hmm. I would love, I, I, it's just, it, it's in Stalin we trust. I mean, it, he, that the, the key with him is you know, where, where he would see him, but he's super intriguing, man. I, I talked to an offensive line coach this week. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, man, I would like to have him because I love to develop him. All right. So there you go. All right. On defense, give me give me someone that we haven't talked about yet. You've got some good intel on. You know, Daxton Hill. I know his tape's intriguing. I I, I know he could play safety or corner. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the corner work was good, but I had um, I had one coach tell me in checking into it, he said he's really he, he did it. He did he did slot corner out of necessity. Something happened mm-hmm. where they had to play him there. I don't remember. Right. Um, but he's going to go in the first round. He, he is more of a he's more of a movable safety. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't seem as a slot corner. Like you could play him in the slot certain coverages, but he, you're not going to line him up at slot corner 75% of the time. He's absolutely a safety. He is not, he is not a nickel corner. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, the Eagle, from an Eagle standpoint, they, you know, with Avante Maddox, they probably weren't, wouldn't play him at nickel unless they were playing like an extended dime where you had two yeah. interior slots anyway. Exactly. So. If you're playing against 10 personnel, sure, double slot. But yeah. Um, you just you want him lining up at safety mostly. You, you, you can move him and let him play inside when you need to. Uh, Charles Cross, I'll give you a couple more uh, before mm-hmm. we get out of here. Charles Cross, the Mississippi State tackle, left tackle, is going to go in the first round. He's not as far as the other tackles are in terms of learning and and being ready to roll, being That's camera ready. Too. Yeah. Um, and I know the Eagles aren't drafting. I'm just saying for we'd have a lot of people who aren't Eagle fans who are listening. We appreciate that. They let us right. know. Right. Um, we, so, yeah, he's – if you're a real draft Nick, or they say, or a big draft guy, or if you're at Mississippi State, he needs a lot of work. He's a little bit farther behind than the other guys. We mentioned Linderbaum earlier. Mm-hmm. Oh, two GMs told me they felt there no quarterbacks in the top ten. We'll see if they're right or not. Mm, interesting. Which I never would have believed that a month ago. But, man, the more and more we hear about this quarterback class. Oh, boy. Yeah. We'll see. You, you want to you want a great quote I got on Marcus Jones, the cornerback and return oh, specialist yeah. from Houston. Cosell's guy, yeah, sure. Yeah, Cosell put us on to him on how 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 tough of, of a corner he is, even though he's only five foot eight. Well, uh, this comes from an a- AFC uh, scouting source. If you have children, I'm telling you right now to either pause this really quickly or earmuffs them. All right, Marcus Jones, pound for pound, the toughest motherfucker in the draft. That's the quote I got. We apologize, folks. We haven't cursed in a, nearly a year. <laughs> I, well, I gave the warning at least. Yeah, so you did, they, and you yeah. said, right, you did yeah. say quote. Yeah, you put it in quotes, right. Compared um, his skill set to Asante Samuel and Teron Matthew. So well, I Asante was, wouldn't press. You know, he didn't like that. He liked to play off. But he he was it. sort of talking about the ball skill and the confidence oh, of skill. Asante Samuel and, and the ability to maybe move around and do different okay. things like Teron Matthew does because he, he's obviously wow. not going to play the outside, right, because wow. he's 5'8". Yeah. But uh, he can so, blitz so, off the edge. He can play a little nickel. Wow. I mean, he can do – you can even put him at safety, he said. Well, oh, wait. Did, did he have the anticipate? remember Asante's anticipation was incredible. Yes. So that's, that, that was his point there. He's, okay. Now, the size, he admits, is going to force him down to a late two, early three. Yeah. Um, but people wow. like this guy. He's like the type of guy that you love, but you'll never take in the first round, right? Right. But, but you small. just love to watch the tape. He, he, he's a guy that you got to get together with the defensive coordinator for the personnel staff. Okay. If we draft and we love this kid, how are you going to use him? Mm-hmm. Cause if, if there's no plan, don't waste your time. Right. Um, a couple more before we get out of here. Uh, Christian Watson, you know, I, I know Greg was pretty critical of him. Yeah. Um, this is a great quote. You don't draft, you don't draft anyone because they look like Matt Jones at the senior bowl. <laughs> Christian Watson ran away from it. He was incredible. Like he yes, was he great. Was. Yep. Matt Jones, I was there. I'll never forget it. My hair was on fire. Matt Jones, nine round. Every it was look, I the Jaguars reached for him. Obviously, he moved right. up crazily. Right. That's when one of the rare times where a guy definitely moved up draft boards <laughs> too far. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a shame. You know, he former college quarterback at Arkansas moved to receiver. But um Sky Moore, all four receivers coaches I talked to before the draft mentioned mm-hmm. Sky Moore as their favorite guy. He's, Another guy that people love, but would never draft in the first. Well, maybe, he, no, maybe he, he'll go to third. First, I think he, yeah. I think he'll, he won't go past the third. He's just he. And we had him on NFL radio. He's awesome. He's yeah. just he's just. I love this kid. Uh, your guy Dotson, mm-hmm. definitely a Z receiver, um, explosive, top forty pick. Yep. Uh, we talked about Burks. We talked about Wilson. Oh, Alec Pierce. Uh, the, the coaches, one in particular, does not agree with Greg on uh, Alec Pierce. Said he's a number four receiver. He does not see what Greg sees. They just don't, they don't look, as Greg would say, reasonable minds don't agree. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty interesting. Okay. I mean, he's got really nice size and oh, yeah. production. 
yeah. uh, and he played in a, you know, at Cincinnati and they were a good team. So, oh yeah, really good. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I don't know if, how that could be fool's gold, I guess, but Hey, if a guy doesn't like him, he doesn't like him. So we'll right. see. yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll revisit this in two years. If he gets drafted in the third round and he's starting, oops, yeah. someone's wrong. Okay. Yeah. There you go. All right. I think we've gone through pretty much everybody there. In fact, this, this wound up taking longer than I, than I thought. All we right. Were yeah, go, sorry, we had a ton of Intel. Um, how to get it out there. Now we didn't get to every single person. I think we just tried yeah. to really yeah. frame it on where we see the Eagles going and then give some of the, um, you know, the, 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 the other Intel that we had on different players. So again, we'll do a post draft post first round show live stream, Adam and I right at the end of the draft. So be on the lookout on our socials, on our YouTube channel. We'll let you know when it starts and then we'll be ready to go. And we're really excited to do it. So without any further ado, that's going to do it. For this edition of Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel, big thanks to Hunter Brody for his production. And you can check out his work on YouTube. His channel is called Sports Talk with Broads, and he's got a great website called BroadsMedia.com. And as always, we thank you for flying with us inside the birds.